So today I want to talk about how we can uh, make serious games sort of tackle subjects with real meaning, right? In some sense, when we talk about serious games, we're talking about making meaningful games, games that sort of engage topics in broader society in various ways. Uh, if we're going to build such games, of course, it behooves us to really try to understand how it is that games make meaning, right? Um, and uh, I, I will argue that there are two sort of primary sort of uh, vehicles or, or semiotic systems through which uh, games make meaning. The rules system and um, assets. Assets are things like, you know, the pictures, the sound files, the textures, the pre-created animations and so on. And these are all features of games that are shared with other media. Right, shared with cinema, shared with dance, uh, and so forth. But rules, and really more generally kind of computational systems or code, are really unique to games as a medium. Uh, that, that games really is the medium that uses rule systems and computational systems to um, express meaning. So first I'd like to start by looking at the current kind of state of, um, of, of practice in making games, right? The current state of game production practice. And really the state of the art is lovingly handcrafted content, right? Where um, we have you know, teams of professionals who have years of aesthetic training under their belt, sort of lovingly creating every little detail of many, many assets that go into the game, whether that's the sound files or level designs or textures or animations and so forth. And this loving handcrafting uh, is important, of course. Uh, it's that uh, uh, handcrafting that allows games to express a particular artistic vision, right? The fact that we, you know, the reason uh, we like to play a particular game um, is because that game expresses a, a vision that we find compelling. And so we need that sort of handcrafting in there. However, uh, handcrafting has some problems. One is it has trouble scaling. Um, and this isn't one that's going to uh, concern us much here for the purposes of this talk. It's, it's primarily kind of an industrial concern, uh, but it is a concern uh, that as we have um, scaled up our sort of uh, production expectations, particularly on current gen consoles and games, um, this sort of uh, hand tweaking of every asset approach is really hitting the limits of economic feasibility and team organizational feasibility. Um, I uh, uh, recently heard sort of uh, in a conversation I was having with someone about the, uh, the amount of money being spent on um, uh, BioWare's The Old Republic, right, their, their forthcoming game. And they're sort of, you know, well north of $100 million right now in the production of that game. It'll, it, at this point, is the most expensive game made yet. And we keep on hearing, like, there, there's, there's always a the most expensive game, right? And, and the state, like Shenmue, back in the Dreamcast, was that game for a while. Um, and the stakes just keep going up. At some point, you can't do that anymore. It just won't scale. Uh, but more uh, significantly, uh, handcrafting limits interaction and gameplay. Um, because one of the kinds of assets that are uh, handcrafted in games are not only the kind of, you know, the visual assets and the sound and so on, but oftentimes scripts. In a sense, interaction is treated in this sort of asset style where we hand create and carefully uh, design finite state machines or other scripting technologies that, um, that explicitly describe the various paths through the game. Right? And this, uh, this sort of uh, deeply and profoundly limits interaction and the degree to which the rule system and gameplay can convey meaning. Um, and really, uh, we've been doing that kind of design for interaction for a long time. Uh, those of you, uh, may, uh, some of you in the audience may have read the Choose Your Own Adventure books that were certainly uh, very popular. Um, I guess I started playing uh, basic D&D. Um, it was sometime around 1976, 77. And it was um, shortly after uh, that the sort of D&D system became very popular and in, into the early 80s that these choose your own adventure books became uh, popular. Uh, and uh, in these books, uh, you explicitly are presented with choices such as, you know, um, uh, uh, the mouth of a windy and dangerous cave is described. And then it'll say, uh, do you enter the cave? Turn to page 206. Do you run away? Turn to page 35, et cetera. That's, um, exactly the same kind of interaction systems that are often employed in games today when we use kind of simple scripting technologies. Uh, so uh, one way to see how um, interaction limits gameplay is to look at a canonical example of a game that wasn't written this way, and that's Pong. 
right? Um, uh, if you look at Pong, you know, simple uh, table, uh, table uh, tennis simulation, um, the, uh, the gameplay for Pong is not pre-scripted what every little decision is, right? There's actually a very simple uh, physics simulation under the hood, and that physics simulation is actually determining how the ball bounces depending on the angle and the paddle movement and so on. And in fact, if you imagined uh, creating uh, Pong using scripting technologies, you would end up with something like Paper Pong. So Google Paper Pong sometimes, someone's actually created this, which is a choose your own adventure version of Pong, right? So we see uh, uh, in the upper left-hand corner there, uh, the ball's coming towards us to move the paddle up, turn to page 114, to move the paddle down, turn to page 117. Click, you turn to page 117, the paddle's a little further down, ball's a little closer, uh, to move the paddle up, turn to page 33, to move the paddle down, turn to page 121, right? I went down again, and so here we are now, and now if we look, oh, turn to page 25, whether you move the paddle up or down. Uh-oh, what's that? The game over screen, right? So um, we can see that uh, um, Pong actually escapes the bounds of scripting. This would be the scripting way of doing it by having a playable model under the hood, uh, a sort of a computational model that is dynamically computing the next state of the game as a function of the current state and the player input. And those kind of playable models, and in a sense the art of creating playable models, is really how we move uh, the field of game design forward. So if we move to this kind of playable model-based approach to, to game design, I'm not saying that we want to get rid of human authorship. Uh, quite the contrary. What I'm really interested in doing is moving that sort of loving crafting of gameplay up to a meta level, right? Instead of lovingly crafting kind of a canned progression through the game, uh, we really want to lovingly craft these emergent systems through which all kinds of rich and dynamic and infinitely varied gameplay uh, arises. Um, and this is more than a simulation. The reason uh, uh, Noah Wardrop Fruin and I uh, like to use this term playable model uh, to describe this, um, and it's similar to what in computer science you might think of as a simulation, but it has more requirements on it than uh, the word simulation. So if we think of a simulation, that's usually um, uh, what you're doing is you have some target system you're trying to simulate, like maybe uh, two black holes colliding together if you're doing an astrophysics simulation. And, um, and then you're uh, creating a source system, uh, which is your simulation that somehow abstracts away details, but still maps variables of the abstracted version usefully onto the real version or target version. That's kind of what a simulation is at its heart. But simulations don't have to be deeply responsive to audience activity, and they don't have to support useful mental models. Playable models do. Playable models are simulations where as the audience interacts with the simulation, it, in a very kind of detailed and moment-by-moment -moment way, responds to activity and responds to activity just so that the, a human being is able to, over time, form a useful mental model of what the underlying system's doing. When I say useful mental model, I don't mean they have to be able to accurately reverse engineer it, but they have to have a mental model that actually provides affordances for making gameplay choices that induce agency. And so this really is um, how uh, a playable model uh, is sort of a simulation that additionally is playable, has these, these additional design constraints. Um, so you know, the, 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 mo the deep modeling of content is really more than just a way out of the content crisis. You know, deep modeling and content is useful because it does allow us to get beyond these production bottlenecks that are being hit, particularly in AAA uh, current gen design, um, but more profoundly, it's really the key to creating new genres of playable media. A new genre is enabled when you create a new playable model. Uh, another way of looking at that, of looking at the sort of raw materials out of which we construct playable models, is to look at the concept of an operational logic. Um, operational logic is a term that uh, Noah Wardrop Fruin introduced in his uh, dissertation work sort of four or five years ago. Uh, Ian Bogost and I sort of both picked it up independently and have sort of developed it in independent strains for a while. And then Noah and I co-wrote a paper for The Last Digra where we tried to bring the strains kind of back together and kind of say, now what is this, you know, operational logic term that several of us in the games research community have been finding useful uh, but hadn't really been nailed down? So I'm not going to prevent sort of uh, operational logics in their full uh, glory for the purposes of this talk, but I do want to mention them uh, a, a little bit because they're really the raw material
materials out of which one constructs playable models. So what is an operational logic? These are the abstract computational operations supporting interpretation that underwrite gameplay. So importantly, these are below the level of game mechanics. I'm not talking about game mechanics. These are sort of the raw material out of which you construct game mechanics, and they're fundamentally representational. These are sort of the units of meaning making that, uh, that sort of couple computational representations with human uh, signs, human readable signs. Um, so uh, we'll go right to an example because it's, it's a kind of abstract and fuzzy sounding concept. Um, the most uh, common uh, um, logic in digital games, not in board games, but in digital games, is the graphical logic, right? Graphical logics are the abstract operations associated with movement, collision detection, and physics. So these are sort of the, the, the units of computational and perceived meaning making that sort of represent objects moving in space, uh, one simulated object colliding or touching another, and objects moving in space subject to physical uh, rules. And if we go back to uh, uh, our old friend Pong here, um, uh, we in fact see these collision and movement logics in pretty much their pure form. This is a game that's about movement and collision detection. The ball moves, the paddles move under player control, and um, when the ball collides with the paddle, that causes a game state change. When the ball doesn't collide with the paddle and misses it, that causes an important game state change, namely uh, the score increments, right? So these rules about um, you know, the score increments, if you miss the ball, the ball bounces off at a certain angle, if you hit the ball and so on, those are specific mechanics which have been written on top of fundamental operational logics for representing movement and collision detection. Um, physics logic um, plus movement and collision detection, basically the whole bundle of graphical logics, were really present in one of the first digital games ever, Space War from 1964. Um, and in Space War, those of you who might have played it in an emulator, um, you have two uh, starships that have uh, 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 momentum, and you basically can do rotation and thrust. It's sort of asteroid-style control. Asteroids took their control scheme from Space War. So you have spaceships with, uh, with momentum. Um, you can rotate them. You can only control them by firing thrust. The two spaceships are trying to shoot each other, and the whole battle's taking place around a black hole that's exerting a, a constant gravitational force that's deforming your trajectory um, and, uh, and sucking your, you know, uh, your bullet into it and so forth. It's actually a really hard game. There was a coin-op version of Space War uh, in the late 70s that I used to play, um, and it was brutally hard. <laughs> this is uh, uh, the physics simulation uh, was sort of you know, a detailed enough model of how gravity actually works that, uh, that, it, that it was quite a challenge to figure out how to control your spaceships effectively. But here again, movement, collision detection, physics simulation, uh, sort of the foundations of um, uh, of you know, many contemporary digital games. Uh, and th th such logics can be put together into higher level logics like navigation logic, right? If we think about navigating the maze in Pac-Man, the idea of navigation, a space of constraint that you can explore, and what I mean by a space of constraint is you can't go anywhere. There's some places you can go, some movements that are disallowed, and you have to uh, figure out how to uh, move in such a way as to cross the space while you know, avoiding obstacles and so forth, well, that's really underwritten by movement and collision detection. When I detect a collision with the wall, then I can say, oh, you can't go in that direction. Uh, when I don't collect a, a collision up this way, I can move. A collision with the pellet uh, updates the score and so on. So really, the idea of a navigable space is underwritten by the more primitive operational logics of movement and collision detection. You wouldn't be able to have the concept of navig navigable space without those two. Um, and this uh, um, continues through to even relatively contemporary games. I know Mirror's Edge is a couple years old now, but in a game such as Mirror's Edge, where you're doing kind of your crazy parkour style acrobatics, moving around a very vertical cityscape, I assume many of you have played uh, Mirror's Edge, um, this still fundamentally is about a navigable space whose laws of navigation are underwritten by movement and collision detection. And what's sort of interesting about this um, is that uh, Graphical logics really underwrite uh, much of the gameplay of many contemporary games, right? That, that, they're, that, that, that we're sort of finding ever more refined ways to make moving objects around in space and one object hitting another be meaningful. 
But you can imagine in, in the space of all operational logics you might uh, create, that seems relatively impoverished, right? And this is why you know, good game designers uh, usually spend a lot of time looking at board games, right? You know, German-style board games, the, the American, the so-called Ameritrash games that have the super complicated rule systems. And, uh, but, but these games are all great to look at um, precisely because they actually um, reveal or expose a huge space of other potential operational logics that are kind of uh, beyond or in addition to logics of movement and collision detection. Certainly in digital ga uh, games and in you know, some of the work that Noah and I have done around operational logics, we also spent a lot of time talking about resource management logics. And resource management logics and graphical logics together actually cover a lot of the mechanics that occur in contemporary games. Um, but but you know, I, I won't pretend that it's all graphical logics. There are some others that operate, but it's still a relatively impoverished set. Um, so the Expressive Intelligence Studio at uh, UCSC, what our mission is really about is creating compelling new forms of interactive entertainment that provide deeply autonomous, generative, and dynamic responses. Um, and this requires deeply modeling and creating new playable models and operational logics around aspects of the experience that are currently static. Right? So going back to uh, that Bioshock example for exa uh, that I had uh, when I first showed, uh, showed the, when I started the talk. Um, you know, Bioshock, you know, much of the uh, uh, writing around Bioshock has looked at things like uh, its incorporation of Ayn Rand's philosophy and kind of critique of Ayn Rand's philosophy in the physical design of the space, in the sort of signs you find around the space and so on, and also its very impressive use of Art Deco design. Right? And this sort of like art deco meets objectivism creates um, a really kind of bizarre and engaging space to move around in. However, that sort of art deco and objectivist aspect of Bioshock, none of that is conveyed through the mechanics. Right? That's all conveyed through the uh, essentially static aspects of the experience. That part of the experience could ha just as easily have been conveyed in cinema where what's sort of interesting about Bioshock at a mechanics level are the sort of emergent paths through which you can do combat resolution, right? And they're really borrowing a lot of that emergence from System Shock. They've basically taken the System Shock um, uh, mechanics for combat resolution and then found ways to kind of map that onto biological metaphors. And that creates, as those of you who play know, um, a, a really interesting potential space where any particular combat situation can be resolved many possible ways, right? And so that shows how, you know, kind of the, the interesting spaces of meaning that are created by the rules versus, uh, in this case, the static assets are almost orthogonal to each other. So, you know, that, that when I played Bioshock, you know, the first thing I thought was like, hmm, what would it mean to really make a game about objectivism? Right? What would objectivist game mechanics look like? You know, that would be, and that kind of thinking about what it would mean to create a playable model around that is really uh, what underwrites um, a lot of the work we do in the Expressive Intelligence Studio. So this includes you know, modeling currently static aspects of the experience, creating new kinds of authoring tools that, that allow you to author these new kind of playable models. Because if you just sort of you know, come up with some you know, cool new simulation technology and it's sitting there in a vacuum like a unicorn, well, no one's going to be able to, um, to write uh, experiences on that, right? You, you have to solve, in some sense, the authoring pipeline problem at the same time as you create um, new sorts of playable models and mechanics. And finally, you actually have to invent new kinds of interactive experiences with it. You actually need to close the loop and try to create new kinds of games that no one's created before, because in a sense, that's the ultimate uh, proof or test that you're doing uh, you know, important and interesting work in the space of inventing these new kind of playable models and new sorts of um, authoring paradigms. So, how does this connect to serious games? This is a, a serious games uh, uh, seminar. Anne might be wondering, how does this connect to serious games? <laughs> um, uh, so let's think about what a serious game is. Uh, the you know, sort of standard definition you might get, get, uh, go, uh, get from going to the serious games initiative is something like a mental contest played with a computer in accordance with specific rules that uses entertainment to further government or corporate training, education, health, public policy, and strategic communication objectives. This is uh, uh, one of the definitions that is used. I'm not so fond of this particular class of definitions because in a sense, this using entertainment to further objectives, 
right? That, that's sort of the key phrase in there. What that's really about, um, in some sense, if I want to read that crassly, is can we use technologies that people find engaging and fun to trick them into dealing with content that they wouldn't otherwise deal with, right? And that's sort of, that's kind of trying to use uh, entertainment technologies as a Trojan horse. Uh, <laughs> and I actually think that, um, like, I, like I'm all for games that are more serious, right? And if you look at the definition, the dictionary definition of serious, this thing means things like requiring much thought or work. You know, this is great. Not all games need to be fun. In fact, facades often been critiqued in the gamer press for not being fun. Right? And it's like, great, it was never intended to be fun. Right? Not all profound experiences are fun in that sort of Disneyland kind of sense of fun. You know, Wee! I'm on a ride. You know? It's like, no, there's all kinds of other sorts of aesthetic uh, um, engagements and interactions with games we can create besides that set that's kind of lumped under fun. Of or relating to matters of importance. Great. I mean, I believe games are and are growing to be the predominant medium of the 21st century. Everything that we talk about in other media currently, in documentary film, in, in, in uh, editorials, in newspaper editorials, in political uh, campaigns, etc., will be expressed in game form already is being now and will be more so in the future. We already see emerging genres of things like editorial gaming, docu-gaming, you know, the art games movement, and so forth. Yes, of or relating to matters of importance, I'm all for it. Not joking or trifling, being in earnest. Yes, having important or dangerous possible consequences. I love it, right? I mean, these are, you know, in the same sense that uh, great literature can be dangerous, right? It can actually uh, provoke someone to, uh, to trying something radically new and different, right? And any kind of sort of radically new and different engagements with the world are dangerous, and that's, that's great. Um, so uh, what I really want to argue is that to make serious games in this broad definition of, seri of, of sort of seriousness, which certainly includes things like games that are about human rights, for instance, um, this requires actually figuring out how to make playable models about these new content areas, not just sort of skinning the content area onto existing mechanics we already have at hand. Um, so uh, playable models in the same sense that um, uh, I, this should actually not say playable models limit serious games. It should be the lack of playable models <laughs> limit serious games. Um, this is a screenshot from a game called um, uh, uh, Photographs for Truth. Um, so it was a, a human rights game. It was Amnesty International's first sponsored game. came out in 2008. Um, and it's an interesting game. I don't mean to beat up on this game and say it's terrible or I wish no one had made it. I mean, I think it's great. People are trying these experiments and these experiments need to happen. Um, but this would be an example of a game where there is not a new kind of playable model and new sorts of operational logics underwriting the gameplay. In this game, you're a journalist, uh, a photographer, sort of going into a country in which there are human rights abuses. So here, um, this is our little camera reticule. So we're going around and taking pictures with our camera. And you basically have to go through as a witness, and of course, you know, Amnesty International is the organization that's all about witnessing, right, and creating, uh, creating um, uh, political change through witnessing. And so that, that's great. They really want to make a game about witnessing. Um, and that, that's, that's a very interesting topic. The way that was implemented in this game is that you have a sort of mostly linear with a couple of mild branches um, experience where you sort of navigate around these scenes, you sort of click with your um, camera, and if you sort of click the, enough of the right things, then you write the press report that gets the positive outcome, and if you don't click enough of the right things, you get the press report that's the negative outcome, right? Um, and so if we think about like the underlying playable model under this, let's choose your own adventure again. This is exactly an example of sort of, you know, a pre-scripted, mostly linear with mild branching uh, 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 content where uh, the game designer, there's no playable model that allows the player to come up with sort of emergent and interesting paths through this game. Uh, there's no, you know, the concept of witnessing 
isn't sort of expressed as a mechanic that you can play with in a sea of kind of infinite variations. It's really a relatively kind of static and limited interaction system where much of the deep meaning of the game is really residing in the static assets rather than the mechanics. And I like the comic novel realization. I mean, I think their art design was great. I think these game designers, it's a very interesting and worthy experience, uh, or experiment, I should say, not trying to beat up on it. But it would be an example of what you have to do if you're going to make a, a serious game about something like witnessing if you don't engage in sort of fundamental and deep thinking about new kinds of playable models and new kinds of operational logics that underwrite those models. Um, and this is something that Miguel Sickert at ITU has been, uh, has been thinking about a bit. Uh, in 2008, um, he wrote a paper called The Banality of Simulated Evil, uh, obviously referencing Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, famous book. Um, where he tries to uh, um, think about and understand uh, how you can create ethical gameplay, right? Because, um, of course, Miguel, those of you who have read the book that came out of his dissertation, he's kind of known as like the game ethics guy, right? He, he thinks a lot about what it means to talk about ethics in the context of gaming. Uh, and in this line of work, he wants to think about, well, how can we create gameplay that truly engages interesting ethical choices? And the, uh, and, and the approach is not to build some explicit meter where you gain light side and dark side points, if it's Knights of the Old Republic or you know, in Fable, good and evil points. That's not how to create uh, interesting and deep ethical choices. Um, and I'm not going to sort of walk through this diagram, and I would cur encourage you who are, uh, those of you who are interested in this to, to go and uh, find his paper. If you Google it, you'll find it online. But uh, the heart of his argument is that he basically says that uh, there's this inner box called the procedural, and this outer box called the semantic. And what he's really arguing for is a deep coupling between the procedural model of the game mechanics and the external semantic model by which the game mechanics are being interpreted. Right? And this is a very similar kind of argument to the argument I'm making with operational logics. Um, he, you know, here he's saying that you know, the mechanics of the game and the interpretive conventions uh, um, uh, 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 that already exist through which those mechanics are going to be interpreted. If I make a game about um, human rights abuses, for instance, like the f uh, Photographer for Truth, there's all kinds of information and pr you know, uh, presuppositions and sort of interpretive conventions that I'm going to bring to the game because of its theme. right? And what this is really arguing is that theme and mechanics have to have sort of a deep coupling in order to achieve gameplay that is truly about ethical decision making. So um, particularly for this, uh, for this uh, serious games course, I think this would be an interesting, uh, an interesting paper to read. And I know I was talking with uh, uh, Julian Tegelia somewhat recently, and uh, he mentioned that he and Miguel are actually uh, embarking on a collaboration now where Julian wants to build like uh, some kind of AI simulation system to underwrite this banality of simulated evil argument. So um, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, I had uh, a student, uh, I don't know, it's like five or six years ago now, uh, when I, I was kind of uh, kvetching about the, um, the, the uh, shallowness of these sort of dark side, light side style ethical systems. And we tried, you know, what would it mean to put deeper ethics? And so uh, this, this uh, student, it's actually Mark Nelson, who will be uh, joining the ITU uh, next uh, January, um, he, uh, he came up with a, uh, a framework for thinking about Kantian games, right, where he took Kant's uh, model of ethics and sort of thought about what it would mean to actually build a simulation of it. So uh, that would be sort of other work in this, in this space. Um, so what I want to do now for the rest of the talk is, uh, is really provide um, a few examples of uh, work, you know, both past work and ongoing work in the Expressive Intelligence Studio, where we're really trying to create new kinds of playable models, and of course that involves uh, implementing new kinds of operational logics that uh, underwrite new forms of gameplay that could be used in a serious games context, right? I mean, I would argue that my, by my broader definition of serious, facade is already a serious game, um, but you could also very easily use uh, these kinds of um, the, the sorts of mechanics that the simulation model underwrites to create a game, you know, serious games about any situation that involves interpersonal interaction, 
right? Whether it's sort of management training, um, whether it's, uh, you know, I, I've seen uh, some work that's been done in the past where people for doctor training have tried to build conversational simulations of um, a doctor having a conversation with a patient where they have to break the news that the patient has terminal cancer. Right. This is the kind of thing that like medical school currently doesn't train, uh, train doctors on how to have that conversation. And so then doctors just find themselves, oh, okay, I, get, I guess I have to figure out how to have this conversation with someone. You know, how do you break that news? Well, that sounds like a great thing to build uh, a really uncomfortable people simulator for, right? <laughs> and, and where you can try out that conversation again and again before you have it with a human being. Uh, so uh, I'm imagining, how many people here have played Facade? Okay, so not quite everybody. Okay, so then it'll be worth uh, uh, showing a, a brief video clip. Um, so Facade is uh, uh, an experience in which uh, the player plays from a pure first person ex uh, perspective. Uh, so here we see they've got their uh, martini glass in hand, uh, maybe it's a Manhattan, and uh, um, uh, one of the major ways you interact with these characters is through unrestricted uh, natural language dialogue, but you also can perform physical actions and navigate around a space and so forth. Uh, the, the backstory of the game is that uh, you've been invited over for drinks by this couple, Trip and Grace, um, and you knew them in college about 10 years ago, and that's it. That's all you know. You haven't seen them for 10 years. They've kind of called you out of the blue to invite you over. You show up at the door uh, to go in. Unbeknownst to you, at least the first time you play, uh, their marriage is in serious trouble and has actually been sort of unraveling for a number of years. And tonight's the night it's all going to explode. And sort of how they feel about each other uh, and about you depends on how your interactions during sort of 20 minutes of high stakes social interaction in which uh, the, the, the marriage kind of explodes before your eyes. Um, our kind of most immediate inspiration for the scenario is Edward Albee's play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Uh, in which, uh, in that case, there's two visitors showing up at the door of this couple that are sort of locked in this deadly game, uh, you know, game of psychological games with each other. So this is kind of a similar uh, scenario, except it's one visitor showing up at the door instead of two. Um, and we're not directly trying to co uh, copy uh, Albie's, uh, uh, you know, particular plot or anything, but that, that was sort of the more immediate inspiration. More broadly, we're thinking about experiences like Woody Allen's Husband and Wives or um, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, um, uh, uh, Soderheim. Um, uh, yes, so this is the, uh, th this is, in a sense, it, this was kind of a prolonged five-year experiment. Uh, it was it's sort of five years to make the game um, in how do you turn that kind of social interaction into a game, which, as we've just seen, talking about playable models and operational logics, basically means how do you build playable models about psychological head games and conversational interaction. Uh, so I'm going to um, uh, switch to a little video demo just for those of you who haven't played it to have a, I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on Facade. I'm, I want to jump to newer work pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So those of you who have played it before, don't worry. You're not going to get uh, a Facade talk from me. Um, I'm sure uh, uh, many of you may be uh, sick of it. So, um, but I, I do want to mention it briefly. So this uh, video demo was put together by basically editing over the shoulder of a player playing um, a, a sort of a bunch of um, snippets shot from the screen of their interaction. So this isn't sort of one straight through play. This is a bunch of edited together snippets. And whenever you see a cut, basically, uh, in the video, that is an editing cut because uh, there, there are no uh, cinematic, um, there are no cinematic uh, manipulations in the live experience. It's all sort of pure first person uh, real time. Okay. Andrew! Ah, I'm so happy you could make it. We haven't seen you in so long. How's it going, man? Oh, we're great. I mean, really, really great. Come on in! Andrew? Hi, how are you? Oh, it's so nice to see you. It feels like it's been forever. Yeah, how, how, how are you doing? Uh, I just asked him that. Well, I can ask him too. <coughs> oh. <laughs> and I've got to say, you look really good. Well, it's funny how after a full day's work designing magazine apps, Grace finds the time to decorate and redecorate. <laughs> I guess it's just the artist in you dying to get out. 
you know, for this corner of the room, I had a desire for something big and bold. Yeah, this is a huge couch. That's the problem with this goddamn apartment. Lousy acoustics. And then Grace buys all of this ridiculously expensive furniture that just sucks up your voice when you're talking. I feel like someone muffling me when I sit on her new couch. <laughs> See, Grace? As always, you're the only one unhappy with your decorating. <coughs> right, I know. I'll never be satisfied with it. I shouldn't get so obsessed about it. It's just not worth it. Ugh. Where's my drink? Oh, hey. So that's one of the You're physical really interactions, is hugging. That's nice of you. Grace, aren't you glad we invited him over? <coughs> Brr. I'm gonna have to turn up the thermostat if we're gonna talk about sex. Patrick, no, that's not funny. Come on. Andrew? You know that flirting with me is only going to make me wish I'd married you instead of Trip. <laughs> okay, okay, that's enough, you two lovebirds. Okay. Oh, I think this evening is over. You believe. So th this is one of the ways the experience can end, is that you can get kicked out of the apartment. So it's a premature ending. Andrew, I just realized. I'm sorry. What? I haven't got enough drinks. When it comes to drinking, I have the simplest taste. I'm uh, always satisfied with the best. So, what's your poison? Can I interest you in a single malt scotch? It's endless. I served them at our last party, they were a mess. Martinis, perfect, classic, great idea. Well, it didn't take long for you two to respond to one another. Tripp thinks he's at his classiest when he's on the serving end of a swiggle stick. Why don't I make us one of my new drink inventions? I call it Grace's Inner Soul. It's a mixture of Chardonnay, bitters, and lots of ice. <laughs> now, Andrew, in one word, what does this picture say to you? All right. Beauty, shading, good question, good question. Grace stayed behind in the hotel room when I was out taking this picture, so. All right, so this gives some sense of uh, interaction with facade. So um, uh, I'm not going to, I just want to briefly sort of point out the major elements of the facade um, AI architecture to sort of understand how that experience you're seeing is, is being constructed by the system. Uh, so the first thing to, to realize is none of that is pre-rendered animation. Um, and in fact, mo most of it's not pre-animated. The faces are fully procedural. Um, you know, the eyebrow twitches, the eyes, the little like eye rollings they do, facial expressions, emotional expressions are all being generated in real time, moment by moment, as a function of uh, an uh, emotional simulation and behavior state simulation in the autonomous characters. Uh, the autonomous character system is uh, uh, figuring out how to accomplish multiple goals at the same time. Uh, at its most complicated, there can be up to like two dozen simultaneous goals in, uh, in one of these characters, either uh, trip or grace that they're sort of simultaneously satisfying. It can involve kind of blocking instructions to try to move across the room in such a way as to stay visible given how the player is currently looking, uh, instructions, uh, goals to pursue certain sort of conversational actions or certain uh, topics. Uh, at the same time, there might be goals involving like physically mixing the drink if that conversation happened to come up while trip was behind the bar. Um, and so really the, uh, the, the high level um, point of a lot of the agent-based technology we created was to allow um, lots and lots of behavior blending. You know, so people talk about animation blending, you know, when you want to blend two or three animations together. Well, this is really behavioral blending, where we want to be able to have independently created behaviors um, and kind of real-time reactive behaviors for arguing about a topic or making a drink or moving across the floor in a certain, you know, naturalistic yet upset way. Um, and then we don't know until runtime how those are going to mix together, when a conversational topic is going to come up, where the player might be standing in the room. Um, all of that has to be sort of dynamically worked out by the system. 
Uh, the drama management system is, um, is sequencing dramatic beats, and so we took the notion of a dramatic beat, which is uh, sort of you know, commonplace in um, uh, screenwriting and playwriting, um, and kind of created an AI operationalization of it, where the system has this notion of these significant moments of multi-actor interaction, right? Kind of treating Grace and Tripp as actors that are gonna move forward uh, the state of the narrative. Um, and the system is dynamically kind of sequencing those and the, giving high level directions to the characters to try to figure out how to act out that, uh, that um, uh, uh, piece of content or that, that dramatic situation. Yet, of course, the player is interrupting them and bringing up other topics. And so these things selected by the drama manager aren't just sort of played out as static content. In a sense, each selected beat is like a mini story machine, a mini story generator, which has to try to accomplish the dramatic goals of that beat um, while remaining uh, real time interactive to the activities of the player. Uh, finally, um, the natural language processing system is doing partial parsing of surface text. Uh, what that means is it's not just keyword lookup. You know, this isn't Eliza um, or, uh, or simple pattern matching. There is actually some amount of syntactic parsing going on. Um, for those of you who might have taken uh, natural language processing courses, um, this would be most similar to island parsing. Uh, we were kind of inspired by uh, some of Shank's, uh, Roger Shank's work at the Yale School in the 80s on um, what he called semantic parsing. Um, except in this case, we're not mapping to semantics, we're going to pragmatics. And so our meaning representations are not semantic units, but they're really speech acts, like flirt, directed at a character, oppose, agree, thank you, refer to topic, and so forth. Um, and any one utterance the player makes may actually trigger multiple. You know, I like the couch, could be a reference to the couch, a, uh, a, a, a disagree directed at uh, Grace, an agree directed at Trip, kind of all at the same time, and then the conversation manager, which is keeping track of the open conversational threads and kind of the state of the conversation across time, has to decide which subset of those are most important to respond to and how to respond to them in the context of the current beat that's operating, et cetera. So that sort of gives, uh, I mean, each of these systems, uh, the, the talk that Miriam was alluding to at the GDC in 2004 was actually like a you know, one hour uh, relatively detailed talk on just the uh, agent behavior language that we'd created for authoring uh, Grace and Trip. So sort of in this, in this diagram, it would have been like this bubble. Sort of. And so there's you know, lots to say about the, the diagram, but for the purposes of this talk, um, what I really wanna focus on is as authors, what did this um, uh, group of technologies enable? And what it enabled was for us to take the notion of kind of the psychological head game and actually make mechanics around them. And so we were most directly inspired by um, uh, Eric Burns' Games People Play, uh, which was sort of a, a pop psych, transactional psych book from the, uh, the 70s, um, where uh, uh, Eric talked about um, uh, these sort of um, recurring patterns of negative interactions that people could get caught in, which were basically these head games that you know couples in trouble might play with each other or friends in trouble might play with each other. So you know, and it's great because if you leaf through this book, you know, the first half is the general theory, and the second half is basically a compendium of these games. And they've they've got great names like Wooden Leg or um, Now I've Got You, You Son of a Bitch. Or, you know, and there's like, there's, you know, this awesome list of these head games. Um, and so uh, when we read this, we thought like, wow, this, you know, this is the kind of mechanic at the kind of rules level that we uh, want to uh, create gameplay around. And so that mechanic at the rules level is being underwritten by the operational logics that this technology is enabling, right? So that's to, to kind of make that distinction between kind of playable model and, and operational logic again. Um, and, uh, you know, this idea of making kind of psychological games units of interaction, uh, I, I think is really powerful. And we went part of the way with it in facade, but not all the way. And what I mean by that is um, the facade architecture still doesn't actually have knowledge of the social games at an abstract level. Uh, and we as authors, Andrew Stern and I, had to kind of figure out how to take a given 
uh, uh, abstract game. And we didn't use any of Eric Burns specific games, but we were kind of inspired by some of his games. So we had to figure out on our own as authors how to take an abstract game, combine it with some backstory material, and create a performance and create performance behaviors around it. The next direction that, um, that we've been going in the in Expressive Intelligence Studio has been to say, well, wouldn't it be nice if games could be authored in the abstract on their own? Right, that you could author, say, an affinity game on its own and then have the system kind of automagically figure out, given two characters who happen to get sort of plugged into playing that game, have it figure out what conversation should take place, what backstory topics should get brought up, et cetera. And that's, uh, that's been sort of the focus of the next uh, uh, project I want to talk about, which is uh, Comilfo and, uh, and the prom.